Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another episode in this weather map analysis series. In our last video, we discussed how to properly analyze the 500 millibar map, which is probably the most important of our upper air maps. Today, we're going to close out our discussion of the main levels of the atmosphere by looking at the 300, 250, and 200 millibar maps, which also hold a lot of importance in weather forecasting. We're going to discuss how to properly analyze these maps and some of the main uses of these maps when making a forecast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, you might be wondering why we're talking about three different levels of the atmosphere in this video. Basically, when we're analyzing these maps, we're analyzing the conditions in the upper troposphere, the part of the atmosphere in which our weather occurs. The issue is that the height of the tropopause, which demarcates the top of the troposphere, changes based on the time of year. As you may know, warm air expands and cold air contracts. So when the atmosphere overall is colder, in other words, in the winter, the depth of the troposphere decreases and thus the height of the tropopause is lower, so we want to use the 300 millibar map in winter. During the summer, when the atmosphere overall is warmest, the depth of the troposphere increases and thus the height of the tropopause is higher, so we want to use the 200 millibar map in summer. During those in-between times, in the spring and fall, the 250 millibar map works best. Now let's say you're forecasting a summertime severe weather event, but you only have a 300 millibar map to work with. Not to worry, in most cases any of these maps will work just fine, but just know that there is a difference in which maps are best to use based on time of year. For the remainder of this video, I'll be referring to the 300, 250, and 200 millibar maps as the upper tropospheric map, for simplicity's sake, but know that whatever I'm discussing does apply to each map just the same. The 300 millibar level generally exists at about 30,000 feet, or about 9 kilometers above mean sea level. 250 millibars is about 34,000 feet, or about 10 kilometers above mean sea level, and 200 millibars is about 39,000 feet, or 12 kilometers above mean sea level. As we know, all upper air maps have a standard set of analysis conventions, and the upper tropospheric map is no different. Just like the other upper air maps we've discussed in this series thus far, geopotential height contours, or isohypses, are drawn in solid black, but now every 120 meters, or 12 decameters, with a base value of 9,000 meters, or 900 decameters. So you draw in 8880 meters, 8760 meters, 9120 meters, 9240 meters, and so on. On the 200 millibar map, the base value is 12,240 meters or 1,224 decameters. Isotacks, or lines of equal wind speed, are drawn as dashed purple lines every 20 knots with a base value of 30 knots, and you can shade them in as you deem necessary. As always, everything else is at the forecaster's discretion. Whatever is helpful to the forecaster is just fine, although with the addition of isotacks, anything else may start to clutter the map. Now, if you get your upper tropospheric maps from the Storm Prediction Center, you'll notice they do a couple things that are unconventional. First, on the 300 millibar map on the SPC Mesoanalysis page, as you see here, they draw their isotacks in solid blue starting at 60 knots, and they use a blue and purple color scale to shade them in, with purple colors indicating stronger winds. They also include a quantity called divergence, which is contoured in solid pink. We'll talk more about divergence in just a bit. If you use the 300 or 250 millibar map from their upper air maps page, you'll see that instead of drawing in the geopotential height contours, they draw in streamlines which help visualize airflow. Streamlines are drawn parallel to the wind direction, and while these are not the same as height contours, they do give you a very similar picture because the farther removed you are from the surface of the earth, the less of an impact friction has on wind speed and direction, therefore the height contours in the upper troposphere are generally quite parallel to the wind themselves. On the 300 millibar map, the SPC also contours divergence in yellow. So the main use of the upper tropospheric map is to analyze the jet stream. The jet stream encompasses the narrow river of strong wind that, in the northern hemisphere, blows from west to east in the upper levels of the atmosphere. Similar to what we discussed in our last episode on the 500 millibar map, the jet stream is comprised of troughs and ridges, those downward and upward inflections in the height contours. These are generally classified more as long waves. Remember, we want to look for short waves on the 700 or 500 millibar maps, and these long wave troughs are associated with large masses of cold air, while ridges are associated with large masses of warm air. Of course, from a severe weather perspective, troughs are going to be most important. Within the broader belt of strong flow that makes up the jet stream are areas of slightly enhanced flow called jet maxes or jet streaks. In this example, we see a couple of different jet streaks, one here associated with this trough over New Mexico, and one here over the northeast. Conceptually, we can categorize a jet streak as either straight or curved, based on, as the names suggest, if the flow has curvature as it moves through the jet streak. Now in the real world, it's rare to get a perfectly straight jet streak, especially those that round the bases of troughs, which, as we know, are most favorable for severe weather, 
but we can use the conceptual model of a straight jet streak to effectively identify patterns of vertical motion surrounding the jet streak itself. So here is a drawing of an idealized straight jet streak. We'll assume that the maximum in vorticity or spin exists on the north side of the jet streak, and the vorticity minimum exists on the south side. Basically, this is a long wave trough, and all of that counterclockwise spin is maximized on the north side of the jet streak. If you're unfamiliar with what vorticity is, check out the previous episode in this series on the 500 millibar map. We can break this jet streak up into four quadrants by drawing a vertical and horizontal axis through its center. We have the left entrance region, the right entrance region, the left exit region, and the right exit region. Now we're going to track a few different air parcels denoted by the gray boxes as they travel through the jet streak. Watch what happens as the parcels enter the jet streak. In the left entrance region, the parcels tend to come closer together, whereas in the right entrance region, they tend to move farther apart. This means that we have upper level convergence in the left entrance region and upper level divergence in the right entrance region. As the parcels move through the jet streak, they tend to move apart in the left exit region and come together in the right exit region. Thus, it's the opposite of what we saw in the entrance region. We have upper level divergence in the left exit region and upper level convergence in the right exit region. This has implications on what happens at the surface in each quadrant. Due to something called the Dines Compensation Principle, convergence at one level of the atmosphere must be balanced by divergence at another and vice versa. So in both the left entrance and right exit regions of a jet streak where we have upper level convergence, we tend to see divergence at the surface and as a result surface pressure rises which is associated with large scale sinking motion and is unfavorable for storm development. On the other hand, where we have upper level divergence, the right entrance and left exit regions, surface convergence is favored, which leads to surface pressure falls, i.e. low pressure development, which is favorable for storm development. Now, as we discussed earlier, the vast majority of upper level jet streaks are not perfectly straight. They have some curvature to them, and that can alter the distribution of convergence and divergence within them. In the conceptual model of curved jet streaks that you see here, the upper level convergence within the left entrance region can bleed into the right entrance region, and the upper level divergence within the left exit region can bleed into the right exit region. This can yield favorable surface pressure falls and rising motion within the right exit region. I won't go into the math and physics behind why this is the case, we'll save that for another day, but the conceptual model turns into more of a two quadrant model rather than a four quadrant model. That's why even though the left exit region of a trough is statistically the preferred quadrant for severe weather outbreaks, we've had plenty of notable severe weather outbreaks in the right exit region of troughs. When I'm forecasting for a severe weather event, I really don't split a given trough into four quadrants. I just look at the entrance region and the exit region as two different entities. Another rule of thumb to keep in mind has to do with diagnosing the progression of an upper level trough, and it involves where the strongest jet stream winds are located within the trough. If the strongest winds are located on the left side of the trough axis, the trough will continue to mature, become more amplified, and move farther south. If the strongest winds are located on the right side of the trough axis, the trough has passed peak maturity, will become less amplified with time, and move farther north. If the winds are about the same on either side of the trough axis, it will remain at about the same amplification. So in this example, notice how we begin with the strongest winds relegated to the left or back side of the trough, and the trough continues to deepen and move generally southeast. But as the flow moves through the base of the trough and onto the right side of the trough axis, the trough deamplifies and moves off to the northeast. So that should give you a bit of a conceptual background on the distribution of vertical motion within an upper level jet streak and how to diagnose a trough's progression. In general, we want to be looking in the exit region of troughs, although on rare occasion the right entrance region can still be a favorable location for severe weather. Now if you've followed me for any length of time, you know that I talk about defluence aloft when analyzing upper level troughs. Defluence is basically directional divergence. It's the spreading apart of those wind vectors in the upper levels of the atmosphere which creates a void. And to fill that void, air is brought upward from below, and that's how you get large-scale rising motion that can prime the atmosphere for storm initiation in a given environment. So when you're looking at a trough on an upper tropospheric map, you want to see those wind barbs spreading apart in the trough's exit region. In this example, notice that in the exit region of our big trough here, the winds over the Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois region are out of the south-southwest, while winds to the south across the Gulf Coast states have a much greater westerly component. This is very well defined defluence over a broad region, meaning that rising motion is present from the Midwest all the way down into the southeast, defining an area where storm formation is possible associated with this trough. Of course, the other ingredients for storms need to be in place, but assessing defluence allows us to identify areas where rising motion is present and storms are more likely to form. In general, the more defluence you have, the more rising motion you have, and the more robust the low-level response will be. Alright, that's going to do it for this episode on the 300, 250, and 200 millibar maps. 
In our next episode, now that we're done going through the main upper air maps, we'll take a look at some other types of weather maps you may encounter when making a forecast. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.